Hi there, my name is Chris Harris and I'm from alloytutors.com and in this video we're going to be looking at transition metal complex ions. Now this is one of the features of transition metals is that they can form complexes and complexes are some of these big molecules that you might see in the transition metal topic. And so in this video we're going to look at basically what we mean by the word complex. We're going to look at what we mean by the word ligand as well. We're going to look at the types of ligands that we can have including uh, a, a word called chelation or chelate and we're also going to look at the shapes of these complexes as well. So we're going to start by looking at what a complex is. Now I've put this on the right hand side of the board up here. So a complex is just a molecule uh, with a transition metal ion in the middle of it and there's ligands that are coordinately or, co or dative covalently bonding to the metal ion in the middle. So a complex is quite a large molecule that can come in different shapes and sizes as well and that's what we're going to look at like I say later on. So I've drawn an example of a complex on the right hand side here uh, and I've kept it quite generic so I've put uh, M in the middle to represent the metal uh, as you can see over here uh, and I've surrounded it with six water ligands which are surrounding it around there. Now a ligand is basically an atom, ion or molecule that will donate a lone pair of electrons to the metal ion in the middle. So for example, we've got water here as a ligand and we'll look at the types of ligands in a minute as well. Okay, the other word that we need to look at really is the coordination number. The coordination number tells us the number of coordinate bonds that surround our metal ion in the middle. So you've got to be careful not to confuse this with the number of ligands that surround the metal ion as well, because we'll come on to that in a minute where some ligands can actually bond twice um, so the coordination number is the number of coordinate bonds that is surrounding the metal ion. So you've got to remember that. Okay, so we're just going to look at some of the types of ligands as well. And you can see here that I've listed a, a few different types. Uh, and we have um, something called monodentate ligands. And monodentate ligands are, uh, like I say, atoms, molecules, or ions, which effectively only have one lone pair, well, they only donate one lone pair, to the uh, metal line in the middle. Some of them might have more than one, one lone pair. So, for example, uh, we're going to look at water, ammonia, hydroxide, cyanide, and these are all classed as small ligands. And this is important because small ligands, you can fit more of them around the transition metal line in the middle, whereas opposed to large ligands like chloride ions, which are obviously a bigger atom in general, uh, you can't fit as many of them around the metal line. So it's a little bit like, I suppose, like pigs around a trough. So you might have your ligands being like the pigs, and the metal line is like the trough. Some pigs, little pigs, can you can fit six of them, effectively, around the metal line, which we'll look at in a minute. Um, whereas the larger ligands, these are like the fatter pigs, and you can't fit as many of them pigs around the trough. So you might say, be only able to fit four of them around the trough, whereas the smaller ones, you can fit six of them. So these are classed as monodentate ligands because they only donate one lone pair um, to the metal line in the middle. Okay, sometimes we can have uh, bidentate ligands, and this means that they can uh, donate two lone pairs of electrons to a metal ion in the middle. So, for example, we've got something called ethane diuate. Uh, make sure it's got the E in there as well, that's really important. Uh, and you can see it's basically just a dicarboxylic acid. Uh, it's got a hydrogen missing from it in the middle, um, and where the hydrogen would have been on the carboxylic acid, we have a negative charge on both ions. So overall, this ligand is two minus charge, uh, and we have lone pairs on the oxygens here. And effectively, how this would work is you would have, and I'll do this in green, is you'd effectively have a metal in the middle, and this can bond twice to the metal. So the one ligand bonding twice. So this is effectively classed as a large ligand, obviously no surprise, and hence you can't fit many of these types of ligands around a central metal line. But again, we'll have a look at that as well when we look at the complexes. Okay, here's another one, ethane-1,2-diamine. Again, we've got ethane in the middle, and amine groups either side, and amine is NH2. We've got two of them either side there, again with the lone pairs on the side, so this can bond twice. Uh, and another one, which is benzene-1,2-diol. Uh, so again, it's just uh, a, um, a, a benzene group uh, with two alcohol groups uh, coming off it. We have a lone pair of electrons on each oxygen. And again, a bit like the ethane diuate, it can bond twice. So if I put my metal there, 
and you can see so I put my arrows just to show that it come in and bond there you go and it can bond twice to the metal line again these are large ligands you can't have many of these around a metal line they're a lot larger than even the large monodentate or unidentate ligand on the top there some ligands are even bigger uh, and we've got ones here you don't need to know the structure of these thankfully because they're really complex but this one here is EDTA um, it's really good um, it has, it's really good at removing uh, potentially toxic metals from the blood and it can be given as a medicine to remove that so for example we've got lead poisoning uh, it can bind with the lead really well and we call that a chelate and effectively it comes from uh, the Greek which means claw uh, a bit like a crab's claw uh, and multidentate ligands have a chelation effect so they effectively bind themselves multiple times around the metal line in the middle uh, and effectively sometimes even six times so anything where we have more than two lone pairs being able to be donated to the same metal line, we call that a multidentate. And one of the most important uh, multidentate ligands is heme. And heme is found in, um, obviously, in your red blood cells and forms hemoglobin. So this is found in red blood cells. So I'll put that on there. Found in red blood cells. And these are really, really important because actually this is responsible, or part of hemoglobin, is responsible for carrying oxygen around the body uh, for allow it to, so cells can use it to um, uh, effectively respire. So, um, and this is also important as well because it, it explains why some ligands, for example, cyanide is really toxic as it can displace oxygen within the hemoglobin uh, and instead cyanide is around there instead and this can obviously reduce the oxygen content in the blood and can be lethal and is lethal. Um, same with um, uh, carbon monoxide is, is, has a similar effect as well. Okay, so just quickly looking at some of the shapes of these complexes as well. Uh, we have something called an octahedral shape. Now this is formed when we have small ligands like water, ammonia, hydroxide and cyanide. You can fit six of these around the metal ion um, and it forms an octahedral complex. Now it is worth noting um, the, um, I haven't put a charge up here, but these, if they have a charge, if the ligand itself has a charge, it will have an effect on the overall charge of the complex. So, for example, if we have a, let's say this metal ion in here is a 2 plus charge, then if we surround um, this complex with six waters, water is neutral, so therefore it has no charge, and therefore the overall charge in the complex will be plus 2 or 2 plus. So we'll put that on there if that was a load, if that was six waters surrounding it. Let's say two of these ligands were hydroxide ions, so OH minus, uh, and the rest were water. Effectively, the two OH minuses will cancel out the two plus charge in the middle, and we would effectively have no charge on the top. And sometimes we can put zero on there to represent that the complex is actually neutral. And um, sometimes we can um, completely replace. Um, all of the ligands, say for example we might put six cyanide ligands around there, if this was a 2 plus charge in the middle and we swapped all the six water ligands for cyanide ligands, cyanide is minus one, if we have six of them surrounding there, the overall charge left behind would be minus four, or four minus, and that would be the overall charge on the complex. So it is important to take into account the charges of the ligands as this will have an effect on the overall charge of your complex as well. And you don't just have to have six of the same ligands, you can have different ligands as well surrounding that metal ion. Okay, so just coming on to the other one, uh, tetrahedral. Normally this is formed by um, a larger ligand such as chloride. And you can see here that we have uh, four chlorines here. It's a much bigger ligand. We can't fit as many uh, chlorine ligands, we can't fit six, sorry, around the metal ion in the middle. So we just have to settle for four. Okay, sometimes we can have square planar uh, molecules as well. And a specific example is um, something called uh, cisplatin, uh, and this is an example here. It's an anti-cancer drug, and it can bind to DNA and stop uh, cancerous cells from replicating. Um, so it's really useful, and this is the actual formula for cisplatin. Notice it doesn't have an overall charge, uh, and hence, if, because we know that ammonia is neutral and chlorines are minus one each, we must know that the platinum must have an oxidation state of plus two by just looking at the overall charge on there. So you can work it out backwards as well. Okay, um, just look at the last one here, which is linear. Uh, again, linear ones 
uh, are uh, have 180 degrees across the uh, across the silver layer. This is uh, an example of Tollens reagents, and you might use this for um, detecting aldehydes, and it will give the silver mirror. And this is the reagent that we would use. Uh, and if you're doing some exam boards only want this and some don't, so it's best to check the specification to make sure you know um, if this if you need to know that one. Again, uh, another one as well is um, instead of cis platen, which is this one here, um, you can have trans platen as well. And this is just where the ammonia is on this side and the chlorines on that side. So effectively, you have two ammonias and two chlorines that are opposite to each other, and we call that trans platen. So um, you might need to know that one as well. And also, some of these complexes can display uh, optical isomerism as well. And effectively, all that means is just its mirror image. So if I was to put a mirror image against this complex, for example, all I would do is I'd draw the other uh, complex on the other side, but just in the mirror image form. And that's all that means. So it's not that difficult, really. Um, just one final thing as well. With these bidentate ligands, as you can see, remember these would bond twice. Effectively, these take up the space of two unidentate ligands. So if we had to use one of these bidentate ligands here, we could only effectively fit four of them around um, uh, around our complex. So instead instead of having two ligands like this, so I'll just rub these off here, um, two, like six unidentate ligands, then effectively what we can have is we can effectively join our bidentate ligands like this. So effectively you have one bidentate, let's say imagine the line represents one of these bidentate ligands, you can see that this is bonding twice, but effectively we've only got three of them that can fit around our metal ions. So that's one, that's two, and that's three. But that's it. Hope that helps. Bye.